All right, I'm starting a new project here that I'm gonna be showing you the design process for. I've actually started this project a few months ago, so we're playing a little catch up on this video, but this new home will be a beach house in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Living in Massachusetts for my entire life, I've spent a lot of time in Cape Cod for family vacations when I was a child to going down there with friends when I was in my 20s. Um, and then taking my own children there as an adult. And it's a very special place that has a unique feeling to me. And it's similar, but a little bit different when compared to other beach communities. There's just something about when you drive over the bridge and that feeling that you get when you first enter Cape Cod that you're just in a special place. And for this new project, I'm going to be providing some more details as we go through the design book. But the first step for me is always site analysis. And then followed, following that up is performance programming. Now site analysis is being about what is special and unique about the property, exploring the constraints and exploring the opportunities. And then performance programming, which we'll cover in the next video, sort of goes on at the same time as, as the site analysis. Um, and that is really in regards to the qualitative aspects about how the family will live in their home and what is unique and special to them. The best designs are a combination of this sort of hard line data-driven analysis mixed with unique abstract qualities. What I like to do in these early stages is to explore both and to establish some criteria which will drive the design of the home. And that way the design of the home is not something that's random or cookie cutter, but it's really rooted in the actual site, the actual place it will be built, and the actual way that the family will live in their home. And that's what makes it unique. So the site analysis phase is a critical moment in my design process. I take so much inspiration from the site condition, from the topography and the vegetation, how the site is orientated to the sun and the prevailing winds and the views. These are all elements that, that are going to drive the initial conceptual designs for the project. It also represents a little bit of a challenge for me, and that is to take my time and slow down. Because at this point in the project, when, I'm, when I've begun site analysis, I've already had several conversations with the client. We have already talked about their dreams and their goals, and I visited the site at least once, but often multiple times, and I've been thinking about the project nonstop. And this initial excitement of a new project and thinking about the possibilities, I want to just sort of go forward and get into the design, but I really need to stop myself and slow down and to really explore what it means to be on that site and what makes that site special and unique. And at this stage, even though I've had these conversations with the client, and even though I have some ideas running through my head, I have absolutely no idea what the, what the design of the home will be like. And it would be very easy for an architect to just take a look at the site plan and the surrounding context and have a general knowledge of the spaces that the client wants to include and just say, here's what the house wants to be, here's where it should be located, here's where it should be orientated to, and you know maybe we'll add some screening over here for privacy, and then just be off and running with the design. And that could work for some people, but what I am really searching for is something deeper, a connection to the place. And that's why I like to slow down and I like to stop thinking about the design possibilities and really analyze the site for what it is. And I'm really hoping to find something unique, something that can provide a story or something that can be referenced abstractly in the design somehow. So as I'm drawing the site plan and then thinking about these moments, what I want to do is have a few moments that are special that I can then work on in my sketchbook as abstract diagrams. And that can be combined with the performance programming and the program analysis to achieve something unique. 
Now this particular site is on an ocean inlet and it's a long and narrow site which is heavily vegetated, especially in comparison to some of the adjacent properties around it. And this, this is a quality that the homeowner wants to maintain. They want to keep as many of the existing trees as possible and to even weave the house uh, through the trees and around them. There's also a somewhat steep slope down to the water where most of the surrounding houses have a long series of stairs going down to their docks. We're gonna see if we can come up with something a little bit more creative and maybe use the design of the home to work our way down the hill as you move towards the water. One of the places I like to start with the site analysis is looking at both the constraints and opportunities of the site. So you can see we have a long but narrow site. We have existing houses that are pretty close to the property line, especially this one to the north. We have a, a, a pretty steep slope that comes down to the water. All these houses have these sort of long stairs that go out to the docks. One of the things that the civil engineer has noted is that this area sort of in the front is the only, is the only area where we are going to be able to place our septic system. And so since the, the site is so narrow, that sort of limits where we are able to enter into the site from, from this corner over here. When I first start doing my analysis, I always like to begin with the solar diagram and and what that looks like. So we're gonna turn on our solar diagram here. So the morning sun is gonna be coming in sort of from this direction right here, and maybe even a little bit like this. So that means I wanna to start to look at this sort of zone as an area for the kitchen or an area for uh, the homeowner to sit outside and have a cup of coffee um, I might want to sort of extend that into this sort of opening in here and, and use that area maybe as an outdoor sort of terrace so that they can sit and have that sort of morning sun all the way almost until all the way almost until the afternoon. When we're looking at the winter sun, the winter sun in the morning is going to be sort of more parallel to that length of the site. So, I really want to emphasize getting winter sunlight into the space. So we have the winter sun coming in like that, and then, and then the summer sun at noontime will also sort of be coming in from this direction right here. And what that means, you know, when I'm looking at this space in particular, where we have the clearing within the existing trees because the homeowner wants to leave as many of these existing trees as possible. So what that really means is if we're gonna look at a roof overhang, and then maybe there's something you know along the lines like this. We want to be able to have it block the summer sun, which is up high, and then allow the winter sun to sort of come into the space. And so that's one thing that I'm gonna be thinking of as I sort of lay out the space and lay out the areas, especially in this clearing, that I wanna be able to allow that winter morning sun in and I wanna block that summer sun at noontime. And that, that could also even apply to, to an outdoor patio uh, that has uh, some sort of roof overhang on top of it. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the winds, the prevailing winds. So we'll turn on the, the layer here for the winds. You can see sort of the summer winds are coming in like this. And so we wanna capture those. So we might use something with the form of the building to allow the wind to flow, sort of flow through, or maybe we have you know, the form of the building looks something like this, where it channels the, those summer winds through the space so we can get a nice breeze. And then maybe we have a space over here where those winds are channeled to. I mean, we don't want to have, we don't want to create a wind tunnel in there, 
right? We don't want to have a spot that's going to be too windy, but we want to be able to have those breezes from the summer come through. When we talk about the winter winds, which are coming in from this direction, we're going to have some sort of structure over here. Maybe it's the garage and the garage might, might work for, for a driveway entry sort of off of there. You sort of come to this little courtyard area where you have these trees and maybe you have some of this existing vegetation can remain and the garage goes here and that garage can act as a wind buffer for these living spaces that are going to be down in here to block those winter winds. We also want to deal with with the nor'easters, which are our winter storms that we get up here. You can see the nor'easters coming in from this direction. So that tells me that this side of the house facing that direction, we want to have maybe as little window openings as possible. And maybe we want to even increase the vegetation here so we get a vegetation buffer. This is going to do one of two things. Not only is it going to block those, those winter storms, but we also have this existing house right here that we have to take into consideration because we don't necessarily want big window openings looking to, into the neighbors. Um, at the same time, we're going to be a little, we're going to try to be a little bit respectful and, and, you know, I don't want to completely dictate the design of our, of this house based upon maintaining the neighbor's views, but we want to make sure that those neighbor's views are somewhat maintained, you know, just to be good and neighborly. Okay, and then speaking of views from our site, let's turn on the view layer. And you can see we have in this, in this clearing of trees, we have a primary view down in this direction, down to the water. So that's sort of looking across this adjacent site, but this house is set back enough where I think that it's not gonna be that big of an issue. We also have a secondary view in this direction, out to the water. Now again, the, the homeowner is concerned about, about maintaining as much as the, of this existing vegetation as possible. We might have to take down some of these trees and that might open up the view corridor a little bit more, but we want to be able to have spaces uh, on the site that has a variety of different view levels, right? Not every spot needs a full wide open view of the ocean. So we, we might have you know, areas like right here where we do have that wide open view of the ocean. But then we may have spaces down in here that have a filtered view. And then maybe we sort of work our way down and we have another space down here on the bank of the river that has more of this sort of sweeping view, uh, this sweeping 180 degree view. So we're gonna have these different sort of view levels. And, you know, we're gonna try to sort of capture some of those views and, and, and get different sort of perspectives on looking out to the water. And then some other information about the uh, site analysis here. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna have this sort of site entry coming in this way. We have this existing house here that we wanna have some sort of buffer. We know that this is a prime view area. And then we, we know that we wanna have sort of this sort of staggered and, and offset series of volumes that that you progress through as you work your way through the house. And that's gonna open up different courtyard areas uh, and different opportunities for exterior uh, lounging, um, a place to host parties. And again, we're gonna have different levels of, of, of shading. We're gonna have different levels of view to the ocean. And it's that variety of spaces that we're looking for. So this is giving us a good uh, understanding of the site and a, a good place to create these, this criteria which we're going to be designing around and, and maintaining the qualities of the site that the owner likes, especially with, with maintaining the amount of vegetation that's on site um, and, and sort of using the, the, the smaller volumes of the house to sort of weave through the site and then sort of being able to capture views where we can. There are a few different ways in which we can approach the foundation design and how the home will sit on the ground. Overall, the strategy here, especially with trying to keep as many of those mature trees as possible, will be to tread lightly. The first way in which we could engage the ground would be to embed the house 
into the slope of the hill. And this would require a large foundation and require a lot of excavation, but one end of, of it could be a, a walkout and possibly have views to the water. We, we may use this method of engaging the ground as a way to circulate down the house towards the water. The next would be to float the structure above the ground and to use a minimally invasive uh, method such as helical piles. This would provide very little site disturbance and it would uh, allow the ground to sort of flow naturally underneath the house. This is a good strategy for sort of these sensitive areas on the site where we have the existing trees. We could also suspend the structure from, from taller elements, which could really minimize the areas that we excavate. And maybe this is a strategy that we use as we're getting close to the slope of the hill and the setback from the water, because we can only build so close to the water. We could also elevate the structure up off the ground, which would get the interior spaces closer into the trees um, which is a quality that the homeowner wants to explore, which I'll talk more about that in the performance programming video, but elevating the structure um, would not only allow for that sort of interaction with the trees itself, but it would allow movement and views underneath the home and could even create some sort of shaded exterior courtyards below. Or we could potentially bridge the home between two other structures. Again, this could uh, be used to have some covered space below, but then also use those support structures as the way to get down the hill. These are all different methods of engaging the ground that we're gonna use going forward as we get into the schematic design. But it's good to explore them here during site analysis, and that way there you sort of have these different options in your mind as you're working through the design. We're also going to explore and have a variety of different conditions on how the home interacts with the trees. I'm gonna tell more of this story in the performance programming video, but just to give you a little, a little sneak preview, the homeowner is an avid bird watcher and wants the ability to bird watch from her home in a variety of settings, both indoor, and outdoor. So having views of the trees and having the home interact with the trees is going to be very important for this client. The first option may be placing the home below the trees with the views up into them. Next, we might have the, the home elevated up and placed within the trees, within the branches, and that way you have this sort of unique perspective of the birds. We could also have the home elevated above the trees with the views down into them. Or we could have trees and vegetation surrounding the house on all sides. So I've already noted the desire to keep as many of the trees as possible and the homeowner's love of bird watching and the need for a creative way to traverse down the hill towards the water. And the opportunity of this is to create a variety of outdoor courtyards that will have different levels of shading and different levels of sunlight and different sort of views towards the water and towards the trees. The simple method of approaching the house might, to, might be to have just one long continuous volume, but that's not really very interesting for what we're trying to accomplish. We could also take that linear volume and break it up into several masses with connectors between them, creating little small pocket courtyards. Or we could maybe even cluster the volumes of the, of the home, having a variety of indoor and outdoor spaces that weave through the trees and that stack on top of each other. When we think about these exterior courtyard uh, spaces, there are some criteria which we can apply. The simplest might be a two-sided courtyard that feels pretty open. This might be good for uh, the main sort of patio or deck area that has views to the water. And that will be used as a, a, a general space for entertaining or outdoor eating and that sort of thing. The next might be a three-sided courtyard, which provides some more protection from the elements, whether that's 
uh, sunlight or wind or rain or whatever, and also focuses your view in one particular direction. And then a third option might be to have a four-sided courtyard, which is more about the interior experience and looking to that interior sort of courtyard. This could also become a place of reflection or meditation or a space to read, or it could be uh, just another opportunity to have birds visible from the interior of the home. So whenever I start on a new project, I oftentimes will go exploring throughout the region, even if it's an area that I'm very familiar with, like this, this particular home in Cape Cod, I'm very familiar with Cape Cod, but I'm gonna go out and, and explore a little bit and, and try to see things through a fresh perspective, as if I'm looking at them for the first time. So not too far away from the property is Woods Hole. So Woods Hole is known as one of the locations for the ferries to both Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. But it's also the home to many organizations dedicated to the exploration of marine life. And Woods Hole is one of my favorite places on the Cape. It's very unique in my opinion. And my wife and I used to take our kids down there when they were little uh, all the time. And we would stop by the aquarium and we would go into the various science and research buildings that are open to the public where the kids can you know look under mic microscopes at, at, at different marine life and different organisms and then of course we would grab some lunch at there's a great taco restaurant which was unfortunately closed for the season while i was down there this time um, maybe grab an ice cream or a coffee and it's it's just really a nice place to walk around it's not too large of an area where young kids will get overwhelmed, but it has enough things to fill up an afternoon. One of the reasons why I like Wood, Woods Hole so much is it has a mix of traditional Cape Cod architecture with rustic buildings and thick stone bases and heavy materials and a mix of modern buildings. You have So you have these massive, thick, heavy materials which are authentic to the history of the area and then you have some modern interpretations which are light and explore the, the the materiality a little bit differently and it's exactly this mix of qualities that i think would work very well for this new home that we're designing when thinking about cape cod in general there's also a number of qualitative aspects that come to mind like most coastal New England communities, there's a, a lot of use of natural materials that have a natural weathering quality. There's also the scrub pine trees, which I love. Many of them are flagged by the winds. There's also a surprising amount of modern architecture on the Cape. I think most people wouldn't think of that and instead would picture a classic Cape Cod beach house, but there are plenty examples of modern homes that are built throughout the region. And a lot of these homes have an expression of structure, which I just love for all my projects, but here it can really relate back to the qualities of the area or boat building and using those sort of methods that you find in other industries and incorporating that into the design of the home. And you really find that not only with the modern architecture on Cape Cod, but with a lot of the sort of historic classical architecture as well. You know, there's also lots of heavy materials, like I was mentioning, the stone and the steel, and a lot of these heavy materials are found in the commercial buildings, but it's something to recognize and bring into the design of this home, where you have a mix of the modern elements and the modern sort of expression, and, and then combine that with sort of this classic heavy grounded materials. So that's a brief introduction into the site analysis for this new custom home in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And I hope you follow along. The next video is gonna be about the performance programming, and then we're gonna get into the schematic design. So I hope to see you there. Thanks, bye.